Somehow I got through the lecture, and the day came to show my work to Bulig. Again, I hitchhiked into L.A., arriving somewhat ahead of time. I rang the doorbell. Bulig opened it and said, you're half an hour early. Come back at the proper time. I had library books with me and decided to kill two birds with one stone. So I went to the library to return the books, found some new ones, and then came back to Bulig's house and again rang the doorbell. He was furious when he opened the door. He said, now you're half an hour late. He took me into the house and lectured me for two hours on the importance of time, especially for one who proposed devoting his life to the art of music. M.C. Richards went to see the Bolshoi. She was delighted with the dancing. She said it's not what they do, it's the ardor with which they do it. I said yes, composition, performance, and audition or observation are really different things. They have next to nothing to do with one another. Once I told her I was at a house on Riverside Drive where people were invited to be present at a Zen service conducted by a Japanese Roshi. He did the ritual, rose petals and all. Afterward, tea was served with rice cookies. And then the hostess and her husband, employing an out-of-tune piano and a cracked voice, gave a wretched performance of an excerpt from a third-rate Italian opera. I was embarrassed and glanced toward the Roshi to see how he was taking it. The expression on his face was absolutely beatific. M.C. Richards and David Tudor invited several friends to dinner. I was there, and it was a pleasure. After dinner, we were sitting around talking. David Tudor began doing some paperwork in a corner, perhaps something to do with music, though I'm not sure. After a while, there was a pause in the conversation. And someone said to David Tudor, why don't you join the party? He said, I haven't left it. This is how I keep you entertained. When Ksenia and I came to New York from Chicago, we arrived in the bus station with about 25 cents. We were invited to stay for a while with Peggy Guggenheim and Max Ernst. Max Ernst had met us in Chicago and had said, whenever you come to New York, come and stay with us. We have a big house on the East River. I went to the phone booth in the bus station, put in a nickel and dialed. Max Ernst answered. He didn't recognize my voice. Finally, he said, are you thirsty? I said, yes. He said, well, come over tomorrow for cocktails. I went back to Ksenia and told her what had happened. She said, call him back. We have everything to gain and nothing to lose. I did. He said, oh, it's you. We've been waiting for you for weeks. Your room's ready. Come right over. Ksenia told me once that when she was a child, in Alaska. She and her friends had a club. And there was only one rule. No silliness.
When I was in high school, I went out, as they say, for oratory. When the Southern California oratorical contest came along, the situation was ticklish. L.A. High had won the contest two years in succession. If we won the third year, the cup would stay in the school's possession forever. I was chosen to represent the school, and I passed through the sectional contests and came to the finals, which were held in the Hollywood Bowl before an audience of about 35 people. My coach, however, informed me the day before that my speech, in its written form, had gotten a very low grade from the judges, that in order to win in the finals, every single judge would have to give me first place. I decided that the situation was hopeless and that the only thing to do was to forget about the contest and just say what I had to say. Apparently that's what happened. The cup still belongs to the school. In Zen, they say, if something is boring, after two minutes, Try it for four. If still boring, try it for eight. Sixteen. Thirty-two. And so on. Eventually one discovers that it's not boring at all, but very interesting. But at the new school once, I was substituting for Henry Cowell, teaching a class in Oriental music. I had told him I didn't know anything about the subject. He said, that's all right, just go where the records are, take one out, play it, and then discuss it with the class. Well, I took out the first record. It was an LP of a Buddhist service. It began with a short, microphone chant with sliding tone, and then soon settled down into a single, loud, reiterated, percussive beat. This noise continued relentlessly for about 15 minutes with no perceptible variation. A lady got up and screamed, and then yelled, Take it off! I can't bear it any longer. I took it off. A man in the class then said angrily, Why'd you take it off? I was just getting interested. Once over in Amsterdam, a Dutch musician said to me, It must be very difficult for you in America to write music. You are so far away from the centers of tradition. Now giving lecture on Japanese poetry. First giving very old Japanese poem, very classical. Oh, Willow Tree, why are you so sad, Willow Tree? Maybe, baby. Now giving 19th century romantic Japanese poem. Oh, Bird, sitting on Willow Tree, why are you so sad, Bird? Maybe, baby. Now giving up to minute, 20th century, Japanese poem, very modern. 
o o stream blowing past weirdly. Why are you so sad, stream? Baby? I was never psychoanalyzed. I'll tell you how it happened. I always had a chip on my shoulder about psychoanalysis. I knew the remark of Rilke to a friend of his who wanted him to be psychoanalyzed. Rilke said, I'm sure they would remove my devils, but I fear they would offend my angels. When I went to the analyst for a kind of preliminary meeting, he said, I'll be able to fix you so that you'll write much more music than you do now. I said, good heavens, I already write too much, it seems to me. That promise of his put me off. And then in the nick of time, Gita Sarabhai came from India. She was concerned about the influence Western music was having on the traditional Indian music, and she decided to study Western music for six months with several teachers, and then returned to India to do what she could to preserve the Indian traditions. She studied contemporary music and counterpoint with me. She said, how much do you charge? I said, it'll be free if you'll also teach me about Indian music. We were almost every day together. At the end of six months, just before she flew away, she gave me the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. It took me a year to finish reading it. I once had a job washing dishes in the Bluebird Tea Room in Carmel, California. I worked 12 hours a day in the kitchen. I washed all the dishes, pots and pans, scrubbed the floor, washed the vegetables, crates of spinach, for instance, and if the owner came along and found me resting, she sent me out in the backyard to chop up some wood. She paid me a dollar a day. One day I noticed that some famous concert pianist was coming to town to give a recital, and I decided to finish my work as quickly as possible in order to get to the concert without missing too much of it. I did this. As luck would have it, my seat was next to that of the lady who owned the Bluebird Tea Room, my employer. I said, good evening. She looked the other way, whispered to her daughter. They both got up and left the hall. Once when Lois Long was on a mushroom walk led by Guy Nearing, a mushroom was found that was quite rare. Guy Nearing told Lois Long that it was Pleurotus masticatus. They then walked along, and Lois Long, realizing she had already forgotten the name of the mushroom, said to Guy Nearing, I just can't get the name of that mushroom into my head. In fact, I have a terrible time remembering any of these Latin names. Guy Nearing said, When you don't know the name of a mushroom, you should say it first to the person in front of you and then to the person in back of you. Soon you'll find you remember it. My grandmother was sometimes very deaf, and other times, particularly when someone was talking about her, not deaf at all. One Sunday she was sitting in the living room, directly in front of the radio. She had a sermon turned on so high that it could be heard for blocks around. And yet she was sound asleep and snoring. I tiptoed into the living room, hoping to get a manuscript that was on the piano and get out again without waking her up. I almost did it. But just as I got to the door, the radio went off and Grandmother spoke sharply. John, are you ready for the second coming of the Lord? During recent years, Daisetsu Taitaro Suzuki has done a great deal of lecturing at Columbia University. First he was in the Department of Religion and then somewhere else. Finally he settled down on the seventh floor of the Philosophy Building. The room had windows on two sides, a large table in the middle with ashtrays. There were chairs around the table and next to the walls. These were always filled with people listening and there were generally a few people standing near the door. The two or three people who took the class for credit sat in chairs around the table. The time was four to seven. During this period, most people took now and then a little nap. Suzuki never spoke loudly, and when the weather was good, the windows were open and the airplanes leaving LaGuardia flew directly overhead, drowning out from time to time whatever he had to say. He never repeated what had been said during the passage of the airplane. Three lectures I remember in particular. 
While he was giving them, I couldn't for the life of me figure out what he was saying. It was a week or so later, while I was walking in the woods looking for mushrooms, that it all dawned on me. There was a lady in Suzuki's class who said once, I have great difficulty reading the sermons of Meister Eckhart because of all the Christian imagery. Dr. Suzuki said, that difficulty will disappear. I was on an English boat going from Syracuse in Sicily to Tunis in North Africa. I had taken the cheapest passage and it was a voyage of two nights and one day. We were no sooner out of the harbor than I found that in my class no food was served. I sent a note to the captain saying I'd like to change to another class. He sent a note back saying I could not change and further asking whether I had been vaccinated. I wrote back that I had not been vaccinated and that I didn't intend to be. He wrote back that unless I was vaccinated, I would not be permitted to disembark at Tunis. We had meanwhile gotten into a terrific storm. The waves were, were higher than the boat. It was impossible to walk on the deck. The correspondence between the captain and myself continued in deadlock. In my last note to him, I stated my firm intention to get off his boat at the earliest opportunity and without being vaccinated. He then wrote back that I had been vaccinated, and to prove it, he sent along a certificate with his signature. Morris Graves introduced Xenia and me to a miniature island in the Puget Sound at Deception Pass. To get there, we traveled from Seattle, about 75 miles north and west, to Anacartes Island, then south to the pass where we parked. We walked along a rocky beach and then across a sandy stretch that was only passable at low tide to another <coughs> island, continuing through some luxuriant woods up a hill where now and then we had views of the surrounding waters and distant islands until finally we came to a small footbridge that led to our destination, an island no larger than, say, a modest home. This island was carpeted with flowers and was so situated that all of Deception Pass was visible from it, just as though we were in the best seats of an intimate theater. While we were lying there on that bed of flowers, some other people came across the footbridge. One of them said to another, You come all this way, and then when you get here, there's nothing to see. I took a number of mushrooms to the botanist, Guy Nearing, and asked him to name them for me. He did. On my way home, I began to doubt whether one particular mushroom was what he had called it. When I got home, I got out my books and came to the conclusion that Guy Nearing had made a mistake. The next time I saw him, I told him, all about this. And he said, there are so many Latin names rolling around in my head that sometimes the wrong one comes out. Cultivate in yourself a grand similarity with the chaos of the surrounding ether. Unloose your mind and set your spirit free. Be still as if you had no soul. Those words come toward the end of one of Quanxa's stories, which, if I were asked, I would say is my favorite. The mists of chaos had spent much trouble trying to come in contact with chaos himself. When he finally succeeded, he found chaos hopping about like a bird and slapping his buttocks. He phrased his question, which concerned the nature of ultimate reality. Chaos simply went on hopping and slapping his buttocks and said, I don't know, I don't know. On a second occasion, the mists of chaos had at first just as little satisfaction, but on pressing chaos, received the advice I quoted. 
In gratitude, he bowed ceremoniously, spoke respectfully, and took his leave. One of Suzuki's books ends with the poetic text of a Japanese monk describing his attainment of enlightenment. The final poem says, Now that I'm enlightened, I'm just as miserable as ever. Dorothy Norman invited me to dinner in New York. There was a lady there from Philadelphia who was an authority on Buddhist arts. When she found out I was interested in mushrooms, she said, have you an explanation of the symbolism involved in the death of the Buddha by his eating a mushroom? I explained that I'd never been interested in symbolism, that I preferred just taking things as themselves, not as standing for other things. But then a few days later, while rambling in the woods, I got to thinking. I recalled the Indian concept of the relation of life and the seasons. Spring is creation, summer is preservation, fall is destruction, winter is quiescence. Mushrooms grow most vigorously in the fall, the period of destruction, and the function of many of them is to bring about the final decay of rotting material. In fact, as I read somewhere, the world would be an impassable heap of old rubbish were it not for mushrooms and their capacity to get rid of it. So I wrote to the lady in Philadelphia. I said, the function of mushrooms is to rid the world of old rubbish. The Buddha died a natural death. <laughs> 